Uh, we now move to questions to the Environment uh, Minister. And I call Chris Hatter. Can I call you Kesha over here? Question number one, please. Minister. The partnership panel will comprise of Northern Ireland ministers and an elected representative from each of the 11 new successor councils. As provided for in the Local Government Bill, the panel may give advice to any Northern Ireland department about matters affecting the exercise of any of its functions, make representations to any Northern Ireland department about any matters affecting or of concern to those involved in local government, and give advice to those involved in local government. The intention, therefore, is that the panel will promote joint working and cooperation between the Northern Ireland Executive and local government. The Bill also provides for the appointment of a maximum of five representatives of such a representative body or association of the district councils as appear to the department to be appropriate. Whilst the Bill does not specifically name NILGA, Views were expressed by members at the political reference group meeting on the 28th of April that NILGA should have a role in the future of the panel, and I intend meeting its office bearers shortly to discuss this point. However, I believe it is important to provide cl clarity on this issue as soon as possible. Therefore, as part of the process to establish the partnership panel, I intend consulting with the new councils about their councillor nominations to the panel and will also use this opportunity to take on board the views of the councils about their association representation. I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Um, can the Minister perhaps outline uh, how, how many times, uh, how often this panel will meet uh, and indeed what resources and support they will receive from your department? Uh, I thank the, the, the member for the, the question. As yet, it has not been established the frequency of the meetings of the, the partnership panel. One uh, paper uh, circulated at the last uh, political reference group, however, suggested that the panel would meet every six months. To me, I do not think that is meeting enough. Uh, the panel will comprise of executive ministers. I, as local government minister, will be present at all meetings and will actually chair meetings of the panel. Other ministers will be involved on in an ad hoc basis, dependent on the agenda, what is for discussion that day and its relevance to <coughs> their department. As I have said, uh, local government will select their own representatives on the panel. There will be one from each of the 11 new councils. I will be meeting with councils to discuss their nominations to ensure that they are nominating representatives onto the panel who are, I suppose, best equipped, have the experience and expertise to deal with the issues, the very important issues that I would hope will be raised at the panel. The panel provides a good vehicle for dialogue at a political level between the executive and local government, and we can use this panel, I believe, effectively to ensure that local government and central government are singing off the same hymn sheet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the minister for his answers thus far? Um, and can I ask him just further to the, the previous questions? Uh, given the fact that some people in local government may think uh, that this partnership panel could become a talking shop, uh, can he give them any reassurances that that will not be the case? I uh, thank the member for the question. The panel, as it is, is not a decision-making body, but under my chairmanship, I intend that it will have a very productive role and not be just a talking shop as the member put it. Membership, as I have said, will be made up of central and local government decision makers in their own right. I intend to build upon that responsibility while establishing and strengthening relationships between the two tiers of government. A number of ingredients are required to ensure a successful partnership. 
And the one that is foremost in my mind is that there is a shared ownership of the partnership panel, and the partners feel that there is something in it for them, and it is worth their while to attend and to contribute. I intend that the panel will be based on the key principles of openness, trust and honesty, with shared goals and values. My message to the future partners is that they must embrace this approach, as well as the Executive's vision for local government reform. Members must move from parochial thinking on operations and create a foundation for strategic thinking on a regional basis. We therefore need this panel to function fully. We need collective thinking and practical input around the table. Otherwise, transformation projects like community planning, which are important to shaping services and improving the quality of life for local people, will simply not work. Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the fact that uh, each council is allowed to send its own representative, it is quite likely that the panel will be dominated by the two major parties. Can I ask the Minister how is he going to ensure the smaller parties are going to be represented on the panel? <coughs> I thank the Chairperson of the Committee for her question. Now, an amendment was tabled and indeed accepted during the passage of the Local Government Reform Bill, that as well as representatives from each of the 11 mm -hmm. new councils, there will be representation from an association comprising of up to five members, which, reading between the lines, one would assume would reflect the five main parties, if you like, or those represented at the, on the Northern Ireland executive. I don't want to predetermine, A, who is going to get elected or how many from each party are going to get elected in the elections next week, or B, how each new council will select their representative on this panel. Because bear in mind, given the new DeHaunt function and how it's going to be applied in the new councils, i.e. run from day one for every year, there will actually be an improved or enhanced possibility for smaller parties, as uh, the Chair has put it, to be represented on this panel and to get positions of responsibility and influence. Sam Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number two uh, to the Minister. Over the last decade, there has indeed been an increase in the number of pedal cyclists killed or seriously injured on our roads. The increase, however, is in the order of 21 per cent. 38 cyclists were killed or seriously injured in 2003, rising to 46 in 2013. It is important to consider this rise in the context of the larger number of cyclists using our roads. Indeed, I believe that almost two-fifths of households here now own at least one bicycle. My officials continue to monitor all road casualties as part of our work, along with road safety partners, towards an aspiration of zero deaths on our roads. My department has taken a number of steps in recent years to raise awareness of cyclist safety issues amongst all road users. Mm. This has included a number of cycle safety campaigns, including the one launched last month. The campaigns were developed based on a range of qualitative and quantitative research. My department will continue various interventions to reduce casualties. I note that there was a welcome reduction in cycling casualties in the last year, from 57 cyclists killed or seriously injured in 2012 to 46 in 2013. My department currently offers a cycling proficiency scheme to all primary schools in Northern Ireland, and I am pleased to report that over 500 schools and 8,000 children participate in the scheme each year. The scheme teaches children to carry out manoeuvres along with some rules of the road via the highway code. I have recently approved enhancement of that scheme. The question of mandatory cycling proficiency tests needs to be considered in the context of this range of other work. 
I have reflected on the member's idea carefully and considered the road safety benefits and costs that would be involved, alongside the costs and benefits of other interventions. At this stage, there is no clear evidence to suggest that such a regime would address the problems in an effective way. Could I, I just remind yes. the Minister um, of the time limit? Mr. Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would take this opportunity of thanking the, the, the Minister for coming back and giving me those details. I accept them, and I think you're on the right path. But I'm very concerned yet about cyclists, their involvement in comparison with uh, car accidents. I uh, thank the, the member for his supplementary question uh, and indeed his interest in this topic. It's, I suppose, extremely topical given the zero fever that swept the north at the, the, the weekend. One would imagine that as a result of the zero and the excitement and fervour around it, that we will see this year and in future years even increased numbers of cyclists on our roads. And unfortunately, the more cyclists, or indeed the more road users there are, the more likely they are to be involved in accidents. I don't like to single out any particular road user or type of road user, i.e. cyclists. That's why my most recent campaign that uh, we launched last month centered on the need for road users, be that cyclists or motorists, to respect each other's journey. So you're not pointing the finger of blame at cyclists for being involved in more accidents or indeed at motorists. But I think a lot of our incidents and collisions on the road could be avoided if we did all as road users respect each other's journey. Here we are. Here we are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response so far. On the issue of road safety for cyclists, I wonder if the Minister could outline which cycling organisations he's met to discuss the issue of road safety and whether there's any ideas that have been generated from those meetings that could be implemented to improve road safety for cyclists. I thank uh, the, the, the member for his question. I uh, chair, on a regular basis, the Road Safety Forum which comprises of all types of road users sorry, and, and their representatives. And indeed, there are a few cycling groups represented on such, uh, notably Sustrans and others, the, the, the name of which escapes me, but I, I will come back to you on that. Sorry. I think it's vitally important to listen to the ideas of road users when it comes to how we improve road safety. And when answering a question from Mr. Boylan earlier today in, in the chamber, I said I very much look forward to the public consultation and com indeed committee stage on the Road Traffic Amendment Bill, as that will provide road users, uh, representative groups such as Sustrans and, and, and other cycling groups, to, to have their input in the legislation here aimed at and I believe capable of improving road safety here, reducing the number of accidents, reducing the number of collisions, reducing the number of serious injuries, and reducing the number of deaths on our roads. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the, the Minister for his response, and I, I welcome it. Um, can I ask him just to re-emphasise again that uh, he would agree that the, the, the key task here is for a fundamental cultural and attitudinal change to ensure that all road users respect each other's rights uh, to share the road rather than singling out any one particular user? I thank the member for the question and he's obviously got the message that was central to uh, the DOE's most recent campaign. And while that attitudinal change of all road users is vital and is extremely important to improving road safety, we must not lose focus of, I suppose, the rationale or ethos of the cycling proficiency scheme and the need for all road users to take responsibility for their own actions as well on the roads. Mm -hmm. 
Callan. Mr. McCann. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three, please. Oh, forever. <coughs> Policy RE1 of Planning Policy Statement PPS18 Renewable Energy does not distinguish between areas designated for their beautiful, significant landscape value, such as areas of outstanding natural beauty and other undesignated landscapes. Nonetheless, the policy requires that all renewable energy development, regardless of whether it is, in, it is proposed in a designated area or not, should not result in an unacceptable adverse impact on visual amenity or landscape character of that area. To assist the Department in the consideration of wind energy applications, PPS18 is accompanied by best practice guidance and supplementary planning guidance, wind energy development in Northern Ireland's landscapes. The supplementary planning guidance provides broad strategic guidance in relation to the visual and landscape impacts of wind energy development for 130 landscape character areas or LCAs across Northern Ireland. Within each LCA, the key landscape and visual characteristics are identified. In relation to the scenic quality of an area, the LCA will identify whether any part is subject to designation as an AONB. An assessment is also made as to the overall sensitivity of the landscape to, to wind energy development. The SPG advice is taken into account by the Department as strategic guidance in processing planning applications for wind energy development across the whole of Northern Ireland. For his response, but uh, does the minister believe that an area of outstanding natural beauty should be an area that's exempt from one farm development? Uh, thank the member for his supplementary question. Wind energy is something that interests everyone in this chamber, I'm sure, and uh, the closer we come to an election, the more interesting it becomes. Uh, Areas of natural beauty, of outstanding natural beauties, are designated as such because they are areas of outstanding natural beauty. And I believe that planning policy should afford a degree of protection to that very natural beauty. It has been raised with me on numerous occasions, both inside this chamber and out, that the current PPS 18 does not afford the protection to these areas that it should. I recently uh, put out for public consultation, the consultation is now closed unfortunately, my new strategic planning policy statement which offered members here, members of the public, people with an interest in planning to have their input into new planning policy. Now I haven't had a chance to go through all the responses to that consultation yet. However, when I do, I would firmly expect that PPS 18, the plan and policy statement relating to renewable energy, would be one of the most thumbed chapters, and I would expect some representation calling for, shall we say, a strengthening of that policy in order to provide increased protection to the areas that the member outlines. Mr. McKinney. Mr. McKinney. Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Minister uh, just following on? Um, when will the single planning policy, or when do you expect it to come into operation, and do you envisage significant change to renewable planning policy? I thank the member for his question. As I outlined in my previous answer, I launched the draft SPPS for 12 weeks public consultation in February. The public consultation has now closed and there have been over 700 responses received. Whilst the SPPS is largely a consolidation of existing planning policies, including those within PPS 18 Renewable Energy, there is also, very importantly, an emphasis on improving it in time for the transfer of the planning function to councils next April. My officials are currently in the process of analysing all of the responses, which will be carefully considered. Once this exercise is complete, 
I will decide on the final policy direction for renewable energy and the SPPS overall. I envisage that the draft strategic planning policy statement will be completed by the end of 2014, subject to executive agreement. Mr. Michael I can I thank the minister for his replies to date? But the minister will be well aware of strong community concerns in areas of the Sperrins regarding proposed large-scale wind farms. And can I just ask the minister if he might firm up on a previous commitment to visit uh, the Brock Derg area, where he might meet with representatives from Brock Derg, Glenelly Valley, and Listenaharney regarding their concerns. Just to firm up on a previous commitment to visit that community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank uh, Mr. McElduff for his question. And indeed, I am aware that certain parts of the North are coming under particular pressure from wind energy development. Cumulative issues are coming to the fore, especially in the West, and my department has already refused a number of planning applications. A number of these, however, are now subject to planning appeals, which will be determined by the Planning Appeals Commission. I am currently reconsidering PPS 18 through the emerging SPPS and whether there is a need to review the balance between the benefits of wind energy versus the impact, the cumulative impact particularly, on the environment and local communities. Mr McElduff identified some of those communities. I had already given him the commitment to visit. I have met with representatives from uh, the, these communities previously in, in, in office meetings, and I assure Mr McElduff the next time I am in the neighbourhood, I will call. Leslie Creed. Um, I wonder could I ask the Minister, is there any evidence that uh, wind turbines are harmful to public health? I thank the, the member for that question. Wind energy applications, as the member will be well aware, tend to attract quite a number of objections. The objections are founded on many things be it their detrimental to residential amenity, they take away the view, all sorts of things, they create a noise. But often, in fact, increasingly so, objections are suggesting that wind turbines are detrimental to human health. Now, where such an objection is raised, we are duty-bound as a department to seek the view of the public health agency, which we do. And often, if not always, the public health agency has found that they are not detrimental to public health. If there is ever, I believe, any doubt that something could be detrimental to human health, I certainly would not approve it or stand over it being approved. Sandra Overy. Mrs. Overy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question four, please. In 2013, the executive agreed to provide councils with a reform funding package of £17.8 million over the 2013 to 2015 period. There is also a further commitment of up to £30 million for rates convergence following the creation of the 11 new councils in April 2015. Over recent months, senior local government officers have undertaken a detailed financial assessment of those additional transition work streams which are both unavoidable and not covered by the £47.8 million funding package provided by the Executive. A total upper limit for those costs likely to be incurred during the transition period, excluding the Executive funding package, has been estimated at £33 million pounds over the 2014 to 2018 period. These costs have been calculated at a regional level and are based on the transition cost data capture exercise completed by the local government sector. Naturally, 
The final costs will be dependent on decisions that are for the new councils to make, including their structure, how best to manage their assets and the state, and how quickly they can start to realise further savings through joint working. I would ask that local government considers the impact on ratepayers of the choices they make and encourage them to be ambitious in their approach to joint working. Mrs. O'Brien. Thank you very much, Mr. And Mr. Speaker. Um, I think that it's quite concerning that the, the figures that the Minister has, has come out here. And does the Minister accept that many councils simply just do not have the reserves or the room to pay for these costs without passing them on to their residents via an increase in their, uh, in their rates? I thank the, the member for the supplementary question and recognise the concern that she has raised that some councils will simply not be able to afford this. It's a concern that has been raised to me by representatives of local government, not all representatives of local government, I might add, over the past number of months. It is anticipated and fully expected that the reform of local government will yield huge savings and will yield huge savings to local government. Therefore, I believe that it is only fair that local government should contribute to the cost of reform as well. I am not dismissing the concerns that have been raised around the affordability of these measures. However, I would also point to the fact that we have sought through uh, the Minister for Finance and Personnel and gained permission from the Treasury that these costs can now be capitalised and therefore this should facilitate and make easy any borrowing that local government might need to make in order to meet these costs. Doris Kelly. Mrs Kelly. Thank you Mr Speaker. And the Minister mentioned the estimated cost of savings of RPA. I wonder is the Minister in a position to quantify any of those potential savings and whether or not the PwC report was actually on the money, so to speak, in terms of the uh, potential cost savings? <laughs> I thank uh, Ms Kelly for her question. The economic appraisal of local government service delivery published by PwC in October 2009 indicated that under the preferred option, implementation of the local government reform program could involve expenditure of up to £118 million over five years, but achieve savings of £438 million over 25 years. This is considered the benchmark cost to bring about a model of a fully transformed local government sector and what associated savings might be expected. The sector's subsequent ICE programme and Case for Change, which included an alternative to the regional business support organisation, BSO, projected savings in the region of up to £570 million for less upfront investment in the same timescale. The local government reform programme is based on a model which involves significant upfront costs, currently estimated at an upper level of £80.8 .8 million during the transition period, while delivering substantial longer-term savings projected, as I've said, between £438 million to £570 million over 25 years. These projected savings and any associated costs will be refined further once the new councils are established and the work on organisational design is complete. That includes all questions uh, to the Minister of Environment. We now move to topical questions and I call Sean Lynch. Good uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister have any plans to meet the uh, British Transport uh, Minister regarding the exemption for all local roads on the HGV uh, levy? Gurmayogut. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I thank Mr. Lynch for that 
question. That's one that I expect to be raised again later on this evening as we debate the HGV levy. Uh, this is an issue that I have written to uh, my British counterpart, I suppose, if you like to put it that way, on, on numerous occasions, most recently last week. However, as to date, I have not sought a formal meeting with him. I am aware that uh, Minister Varadkar, the Republic of Ireland Minister, has sought and obtained a meeting with him, and I have been liaising closely with my southern counterpart on this issue to ensure that we are very much asking for the same thing. We have, to date, been asking for the same thing. Unfortunately, neither of us, neither of us have thus far got it. That uh, will not stop me trying. As I said, I, 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 I wrote back again last week to Stephen Hammond, and this is something that, that we're keeping a very close eye on and maintaining a focus on. And this afternoon's debate, I'm sure, will ensure that we do as well. Sean Lynch. I'm going to go on quick as Leishan Aras and Fragrishan. Can the Minister explain if his officials are involved in any enforcement arrangements at this time? I uh, thank Mr Lynch for his supplementary question. As negotiations are ongoing between myself, Minister Varadkar and Minister Hammond around exempted routes, if not all exempted roads, I believed it would have been premature of me to bring the SL1 to Environment Committee. And while that uh, piece of subordinate legislation has not gone through committee, uh, my officials, DOE officials, do not have the power to enforce here and therefore are not enforcing. Currently, no one is enforcing the HGV levy within Northern Ireland. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to stick with something that is topical at the minute, obviously, our local government elections. Has the Minister issued any guidance to the new Super Councils around the issue of how they should actually handle the new uh, planning issues that are, and planning powers that are being given to them? I didn't know there were elections. <laughs> I, no, I, I thank uh, the, 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 the member for his question. I have been, uh, over the past number of months, around all, well, all bar one of the 11 statutory transition committees, meeting uh, individuals who will, one would assume, I am sure they assume, will form the new councils as well. They have been asking, sharing concerns with me, and one of them, one of the principal concerns that have been raised is around the transfer of the planning function. I remember as a, a councillor in Derry City Council sitting with colleagues who would occasionally rub their hands when we were having a planning committee meeting and say to the planners sort of things like, I can't wait till we get you in here. However, now as the time approaches that it's becoming more of a reality, councillors seem to be sort of, we don't want you in here, as it dawns on them that along with the power of planning will come a tremendous responsibility. Therefore, as part of the capacity building train, uh, program for new councillors, planning is po possibly comprises the largest part of that. I will, uh, community planning are a very well known and worthwhile organisation, and they have actually been awarded a contract from the department to take part and, and give out that uh, planning to the new councils and councillors and indeed council staff and planning staff will need training as well as they get used to the new regime. Training will take part in, in many other ways as well. I, I would be very hopeful of setting up mock planning committee meetings as the council operates in shadow form just so the councillors can get a grasp of what will be expected of them. Because another difficulty that's going to be posed to councillors is now that they will have the responsibility for making planning decisions, or at least the members of the planning committee will, that their lobbying role, traditional lobbying role, will be somewhat 
compromised, if not castrated. So that's something that they are going to have to weigh up as well. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that. Um, that uh, really is the nub of the issue here. Um, as a decision maker, you can't be a lobbyist. Has any guidance been given to the actual size or makeup? Off the planning committees within these new super councils, as it seems illogical that all councillors would be on it, as is common practice today. And also, has any thought been given to indemnity for that planning committee or some sort of insurance? Because we can see the legal nightmare that could face them. Can I just remind the minister of the two-minute rule? Don't worry, I won't take as long this time. <laughs> uh, where were we? Uh, the size of the committees themselves will be a matter for the new councils. However, what Mr Craig refers to as common practice now, where, some, or where planning committees comprise of all council members, that certainly will not be the case. And I can't imagine that there will be a huge queue to, of, of councillors to join the planning committee. Also key to this will be the new statutory code of conduct for councillors as well. Given the situations that some councillors could now find themselves in, where, where maybe they are having to make a planning decision, they could, they could actually have to make a decision now on something that they previously or are currently lobbying on. They might inherit that, that, that case. So the issue of, around indemnity is another one that's very important. That will involve, that will be involved also in the capacity building and in the new code of conduct for councillors and councils. Alec Maskey, Mr. Maskey. Can, Corley, can I ask the minister, has, uh, would he have any information or any update? And it's really in terms of the context of the transfer of powers local government, but in terms of the dereliction funding stream. Has the minister given any consideration to other uh, like city centre, thinking Belfast here, uh, gateway projects, for example, dereliction all around Crumming Street? I thank the member for his question. The dereliction scheme or dereliction fund was a hugely, or has been, sorry, a hugely successful initiative uh, launched by my predecessor, Alex Atwood, and. To date, I think 24 of the 26 councils have successfully availed of the scheme, where they're able to actually have a, a huge beneficial impact on town and city centres for relatively small amounts of money. Unfortunately, at the last monitoring round, uh, my bid to get uh, more money for the dereliction fund was unsuccessful. However, I will be having a new attempt in the June monitoring round. I have been inundated with correspondence from MLAs and councillors from across the north. They have seen how this has benefited other areas and their own and would like to see more. So I am hopeful that my colleagues in the executive will, will give me more to give them. Mr. Maskey. I can thank you, Minister, for that uh, response. Uh, could I ask the Minister, had, could he, would he, or has he considered having any further discussions with, for example, DSD? Because I am thinking particularly in and around area Lake Cromick Street, which is a gateway from a residential area right through into the city centre and, and outward, of course, as well. So it would actually help to regenerate that area, plus as well make a much better improvement for economic uh, opportunities as well in that lower arm uh, area. I uh, certainly recognise the, the benefits that uh, regeneration can bring, and I think it is important, uh, as the member outlines, that my department liaise with and work with other departments, such as DSD, who are responsible for regeneration on issues such as this. In fact, just recently, when the bids, uh, a business improvement district debate was ongoing, and I know it is to come back to, to, to this assembly. I, in my executive response, I have considered how my dereliction fund could tie in with that, so you're, you can actually maximise the benefit of government intervention into an area or areas 
rather than one department try and do something now and someone else come along three years later to try and do another. But I think it's, it's vitally important that we collaborate in order to get the biggest bang for our buck and benefit uh, the businesses and, and people of the region when doing so. Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I'm sure the House would agree with me that the recent gyro this weekend was a great success, but I must say I noticed a number of photos taken uh, of the event in Belfast, where of cyclists passing the paramilitary murals. Would the Minister agree that people would have used more positive images if we had repainted these murals as well as not putting up the election posters? I uh, thank Ms Lowe for her question. Uh, first of all, again, I'd, I'd like to reiterate my I suppose, thanks and congratulations to all those involved in the Giro and in making it a success. And I'd also like to use this opportunity to thank political parties here for the spirit in which they entered into the agreement not to put political or election posters up along the route. I think we displayed a great deal of maturity and showed that we can work together to achieve things when they are for the common good. However, there are those outside of this House who refuse to do that. I do not have within my remit any control over paramilitary murals or indeed flags. I regret very much that I don't, but I believe that we could work collectively again to tackle the blight of paramilitarism right across the North, and I think that's something that we should be and must be resolved to do. I thank the Minister's uh, uh, willingness to do this. And, um, I, I would like to, to, to see the department maybe working with other uh, executive um, uh, colleagues uh, to work on this. Uh, to, so I just wonder, is there any move afoot uh, uh, to ensure that murals are re-imaged and, and, and removed in order for us to showcase uh, Belfast in a better light for future events? Uh, well, this uh, is an issue that was raised during and throughout the Haas discussions. Richard Haas was unable to resolve them in a couple of months, and <laughs> I've been unable to do so in a couple of weeks. In fact, you could say that we've been unable to do so in a couple of centuries. However, that shouldn't dilute our desire to deal with these issues, and it certainly won't dilute mine or my parties. We are happy to work with any party and all parties to tackle this issue head on. As regards the removal of murals, the re-imaging of communities, I believe that the new councils can have a vital role in doing this through the new power of community planning, especially where everyone can come and everyone can have their say in what their area should look like. And I believe it is vitally important that we encourage people to participate in that process. Just, just before I take John Bell's point of order, I think there are two issues I want to raise. Question time is a very important time in this House where backbenchers can hold ministers uh, to account. And all parties uh, do extremely well in being called to make a contribution. But I am concerned that we have long-standing members of this House members who have been elected to this House for some years who still want to read out uh, supplementary questions. And I would ask members, especially long-standing members of this House, to set an example uh, to members uh, that they should refrain from reading out supplementary questions. I think members who want to keep notes at their table refer to the notes. I don't think there's any problem in that. But I have to say, uh, even seasoned politicians in this House are still wanting to read out supplementary questions. In any other institution, I can assure members that would not be happening. On the other issue, um, I think it is important uh, when ministers come to this House that they address ministers by their proper title, whether well, it's the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, or any minister. 
And I know uh, this afternoon, I think, uh, most members, it wasn't deliberate. Uh, I think it was accidental more than anything else. And I think I'm being honest when I say that. But I think it's also important that ministers coming to this House are also showing respect. And I take Jonathan Bell's uh, point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member for East Antrim and Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister at uh, question time referred to the next executive meeting as being the 28th, uh, as well as some other things that could cause confusion. Can clarify that the executive is set for the 29th, that from today, I think he made some comment about six weeks, but from today, over the last six weeks, the executive has sat twice. It normally sits fortnightly, Mr. Speaker, the 22nd of May, obviously, with the local and European elections uh, being on that day. It is not meeting, but the executive will meet uh, twice in May. Order. I think that's a very important clarification on, on that particular piece of business. Order members. Order members. And the junior minister now has corrected what was said earlier. And I think that's important. And there is a procedure when ministers come into the House to correct information that's not, uh, is, that is not correctable. But I think that's important. Pat Ramsey. Mr. Speaker, I learned today on a visit to the business office that I was not on my place on the 29th of April during decal questions, of which I was in another place. And, but I want to apologise to the House and to the Minister involved. I appreciate the member coming to the House and, and apologising. I hope that sets an example for other members, and I do know the member was in the hospital at that time. But uh, I have a list of members here at the table who have still, uh, who were in their place this afternoon, but who didn't feel fit uh, to rise in their place before they asked their question uh, to apologise. So we do have a note at the table of members who still haven't come to the House to apologise to this House. Oh, sorry, P point of order, Mr. Swan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, although my name isn't on that list, um, the name of my party colleague, Mr. Cree, is. Mr. Speaker, as Chief Whip, Mr. Cree had informed me he would not be in the House, and I feel in my duty in informing the Business Committee. So I apologise to the House, and I apologise to Mr. Cree. Hey, that's a very brave Chief Whip. Uh, that, is, uh, that is taking his responsibility very seriously, and I appreciate the, the member coming to the House and explaining to the House the reason the minister, why the member, uh, who is one member, wasn't in the House. And I think that's vitally important as well. L let us move on. Let us move on.